welcome to the Something More series. I'm excited to share this with you. I have at various times presented it live and also one-on-one -on -one with individuals, but this is the very first time that I have done so online, prepared for you. Before we go any further, I just want to ask you to do two things. Number one, hit subscribe, which is the button right down here below, and you will also have access to the different sessions as they come available. And the second thing I'd ask you to do, share it with somebody else you think might be interested after you've watched it and you're convinced that it was something worthwhile. Okay, let's just dive in um, and go for it. If you were to go to Lassen Peak in California, you would find this, line, this array of satellite dishes that you see here pointed to the sky and listening. And you would have discovered SETI the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, I think many people have wondered, I wonder if there's really anything out there. Is there anyone listening? Anyone trying to communicate? 24-7, these telescopes here and in other places listen into the galaxies to find out if there really is intelligent life. Now, you and I might wonder if there's actually intelligent life here on this Earth, much less out in the galaxies. But that's a whole other sermon. A few years ago, 1985, Carl Sagan, the great cosmologist, and don't freak out, cosmology is the study of the universe, he wrote a novel, published it, Contact. And in 1997, the movie of the same title was put out, and Jodie Foster was the lead character. Her character, Ellie, made it her life's mission to listen for intelligent life. She'd had a rough upbringing and childhood and so that was part of the baggage that came into the movie. But here she was, and she just dedicated hour after hour, day after day, week, month, year, listening. And then one day while she was listening, she heard it. It was not describable at first. But then as she listened, and as they started to interpret it, they realized something was being communicated. What was being communicated were numbers. Mathematical numbers. What were they communicating? Well, as the information came through, they started to process it, and they recognized that they were sending plans. Well, it didn't really make sense at first until they looked at it in a different way and realized they were three-dimensional plans, and what they sent were plans for what you see here, which was to be some type of a spaceship in a way to travel to where the people who were communicating were so that the people on Earth, or wherever the world was hearing it, would be able to build this and get there. Well, her, her uh, partner in the program, Joss, he said, you know, I believe in God. Do you believe in God? I think I should go because I believe in God. You don't believe in God. Maybe you shouldn't go because I really do think there's intelligent life out there. You don't, so maybe you shouldn't go. And they got in disagreement about it. But eventually, Ellie gets into this uh, contraption that you see here and she flies off to space. Well, I'll let you watch the movie to determine what the balance of the movie was about and whether or not it was worth watching. But it is intriguing. It is considered one of the most thought-provoking science fiction movies that has been done here in the last 25 to 30 years. But Ellie and others at SETI, I don't think they're alone. I mean, have you ever walked outside and looked up at the stars and thought, am I alone? Is there anybody else out there that's listening, paying attention, or are we just here in the universe by ourselves? Now, we're here on our beautiful globe, and we tend to be very centric. I mean, for the longest time, for almost two, three, four plus millennium, we thought that everything in the universe revolved around us. Copernicus kind of ruined it. Galileo pushed it. He even spent some time in house arrest because of it. And he said, hey, wait a minute. That is not what happens. We are revolving around the sun and the universe is moving and we are shifting through the universe. So it was quite controversial at the time, but you know, now we look at it and say, huh, there are still people who are flat earth, but that, again, that's another topic. But here we are in this beautiful globe. Astronauts, when they have been able to fly to the moon, have looked back and they said, what an incredible, peaceful place this looks like. It doesn't even, rec you don't recognize it when you're on this planet, all the wars and the famines and the things that are going on. But you move away and you say, what an incredible view. 
So the nearest object to the Earth, as you see here, is our moon. Now our moon is fairly decent size. You can see it most of the time, it goes in phases. And if you look here, it tells you we are 238,900 miles away. Now in relative comparison to the Earth, the Earth has a diameter of about 8,000 miles and a circumference, that means you can travel all the way around it, it takes about, it's about 25,000 miles. So the moon is considerably smaller, but it's close by. But I want to give you an idea just how far it is away, how long it would take to get there, and the relationship that we have and our moon with other things in not only our solar system, but also our galaxy and our universe. Now I love to go fast, and one of my dreams is to get into a NASCAR car and go flying down the speedway. I love watching Talladega, Daytona, where they hit over 200 miles an hour. If you were to get into the space shuttle, you would hit a amazing speed. Once you have left gravity and you have accomplished everything you need to to get into orbit, you would hit a speed of 17,500 miles. Now that's flying. I mean, that would be awesome. But you don't really realize it because you're up in the, on the planet and the gravity is gone and you're just kind of like hanging there and the earth is moving and you're like, okay, this is great. But let's say that you could realistically feel and tell how fast you're actually going and you were to fly to the moon. This is how long it would take you. 13.65 hours traveling 17,500 miles per hour. That's not bad. It takes about 90 minutes to get around the orbit of the earth and then you could shoot in less than 14 hours you can be to the moon if you're on the space shuttle. So not bad. Not bad. Now let's consider our sun. I mean, we'll bypass our other planets. we got Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. If we were to go closer to the sun, we have Venus and then and Mercury. But we get right to the sun, this big, blazing, hot ball of fire and gas. The sun is incredible. It is a diameter of 865,370 miles, which is 109 times greater than the size of the Earth. In fact, you could take 288 Earths and pack it within the sun. It is 93 million miles away, and if you were to travel again on the space shuttle, it would take you 222 days to get there if you left planet Earth. So, you circle around, take 90 minutes to get around the Earth, you take 14 hours to get to the moon, and pew, you head on off to the sun, and it would take you 222 days to get there. That's not bad, I mean, it's doable if you were on the space shuttle traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. Now the nearest star to our sun is this one, Proxima Centauri. And we have to look at it in a, in, in a slightly different measurement. As you see here, we look at it in light years. A light year is almost 6 trillion miles. If you were to do a light year times 4, it would take you 100, ready for this? 161,095 years traveling at 420,000 miles per day, which is 17,500 miles per hour. Okay, are you ready? I mean, go over this again. Look at it. 161,095 years traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. That's how long it would take you to get there. <laughs> we are alone, it would seem like, but maybe we're not really. All right, if you were to go up in the, into the night sky, to, um, and probably the southern sky is going to give you the best, Texas or even south of here, you would look up into the sky and you would see Sirius, not the satellite radio, but the actual star, which is the most visible and brightest in our night sky to all of us in our naked eye. This is an incredible star, but do you realize that it is twice as far away as Proxima Centauri? So just imagine that. It would take you about 325,000 years to travel there at 17,500 miles per hour. Okay, our nearest galaxy, outside of ours, Milky Way, is Andromeda. I mean, this swirling ball of gas, stars, nebulas, is incredible. It's the closest one. And all sprinkled out throughout the universe are these incredible, beautiful, amazing nebulas, gaseous components, and they are awesome. I mean, look at the beauty. Look at the colors. This is gas and radiation. Now, Hubble Telescope flies and kind of orbits above the Earth. 
And it's been there for a number of years. In fact, you probably remember, I think it was about a decade ago, they actually had to go up and do surgery on its eyeballs and its mirrors to make sure that it could see clear. Astronomers were wanting to know, they said, what would happen if we take the Hubble and we were to point it at this specific area of the, of the sky that we think has nothing in it? In fact, it's dark. If you were to take your pinky finger, I, I have about average, and the size of your fingernail, and you were to hold your finger out, that's the size of the sky that they decided to point the Hubble Space Telescope at. The first go around, they let it go for almost two weeks. Then they said, well, wait a minute, that's pretty cool. What if we were to do it for about twice as long? And I believe they did it for 27 days, and this is what they found. These are galaxies. Are you looking at this? Galaxies that have been formed and have been placed there. This incredible light, and each one of those galaxies has billions of stars in it. We are not alone. Woo, this is amazing. I get excited just thinking about it and, and looking at it. I'll let you look at it one more time. This is incredible. Where'd it come from? How long has it been here? Well, Einstein had, had a lot of those questions, and Einstein had always believed in this eternal universe, meaning it's just been here all the time, never had any start point. But he had this theory called general relativity that actually said that the universe may have had a starting point. Well, remember the Hubble telescope? That's named after an actual person, Edwin Hubble, who in 1927, he went here to this telescope that you see, uh, Mount Wilson. It's a 100-inch telescope, and he sat down and he did some studies. And he noticed something as he was observing the galaxies. There was a red shift. What this meant to him was, wait a minute, there may actually be proof that the universe is growing and expanding and actually had a starting point. It hasn't always just been there. It started from something small, and it's been growing outwards. Therefore, there's a red shift, the light shift. Again, Einstein, he believed that this was an eternal universe, and he didn't like the idea. It's like, well, I got this theory of general relativity. I'm not really sure that I like it. He actually fudged his numbers. He actually tried to divide zero by itself. You can't divide zero if you know math. Even if you don't know math, we all know you don't divide zero. Well, he tried to divide zero to prove, no, no, uh, the universe has always been tried to disprove his own theory that he thought in the back of his mind might actually be true. Well, he heard about Hubble's findings, and he made a journey up two years later to the same telescope that you see here, and he looked through the telescope, and he saw the exact same thing that Edwin Hubble saw, and he said, I was wrong. My theory that the universe has been eternal may be the greatest blunder of all my scientific career. There's no doubt in my mind that there was a, a, a starting point for the universe, and this is what he had to say. To know how God created the world... I'm not interested in this or that phenomenon, in the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his thoughts. The rest are details. He confirmed it. Hubble, others, this big bang. Out of, out of just nothing, bam, the universe came into play. And it just started growing and growing and growing and growing from there. Well, eh, is that really what happened? Now, this author a number of years ago, Anthony Kenny, he wrote, you want to consider the Big Bang? Well, let's look at it together. According to the Big Bang Theory, he writes, the whole matter of the universe began to exist at a particular time in the remote past. A proponent of such a theory, at least if he's an atheist, must believe that the matter of the universe came from nothing and by nothing. Did you grasp that? I, I want you to go back and look at this one more time. A proponent of such a theory, this Big Bang, if he's an atheist, must believe that the matter of the universe came from nothing and by nothing. So here's this Big Bang. So in 1948, the other scientists start putting the theory, well, if there was a Big Bang, then there must be radiation and there must be heat and light transfer that occurred, this afterglow that, that came from the, the Big Bang. In 1948, scientists started to explore this idea of the Big Bang, and they said, okay, if there was a Big Bang and there was a movement outwards, and there was a huge explosion. There must be an afterglow, radiation, heat, microwaves. And they wondered about it. Well, there's got to be something. There must be evidence. But they hadn't found anything uh, until 1964 when two astronomers, Penzias and Wilson, were at the Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. And they had a, as you see here in the picture, they had this um, funky-looking horn satellite. Well, they got access to the satellite, and they started pointing it around, looking for signs of something in the galaxies, noise or Something incredible. And they started to get these weird transmissions. It, it came from everywhere. Well, at first they thought, well, we must be getting distortion because of the birds or something. So they went outside and they found bird poop all over the inside of the horn satellite. And they cleaned it out. Then they found pigeons were nesting in there, so they got rid of the pigeons. Well, I'll let you decide how they got rid of them. But they were gone. And they started to still point this horn satellite 
and they kept getting these weird noises. And it didn't matter if they pointed it north, south, east, west, up, down, didn't matter. They still got the noises, and they started talking to other astronomers, and the astronomer said, if you're getting that, you might be onto something. You may have found the secret to the Big Bang. This radiation, this microwave transmission, this afterglow from the Big Bang would sound just exactly as you are hearing. It was confirmed in 1965, after about a year, a little over a year of study, that they had indeed found the afterglow, the remnants of that proved that there had been a starting point for the universe. In 1978, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery. So, this is a great, amazing discovery. Other scientists started to think about it. Now, Robert Janslow, he, he, he published something very specific about it. He uh, had occupied the same chair that Edwin Hubble did at, at the Mount Wilson Observatory, and he started to take this information that had been received, this proof of the Big Bang, and he said, you know what, I'm gonna, he, he, he reckoned, he said, look, I'm an agnostic. I don't have anything to prove. Maybe even, even venture towards more of an atheist. But here's what I think is important for you as he's writing. Now we see how the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The details differ, but the essential elements in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis are the same. The chain of events leading to man commenced suddenly and sharply at a definite moment in time in a flash of light and energy. He's saying you can give some credence to what those who believe in creation because whether it's the view of the Big Bang or the view of a creator who created it, it started the same. So the evidence is point that there are some similarities. Well, he goes on. Astronomers now find they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in this cosmos and on the earth. I'm going to go from gazing through a telescope to the amazing universe to looking at through a microscope at, at the amazing things that you'll find. And here we have an amoeba. It's a single cell. But wouldn't you know, there had to be one man, and now more, who say that all life came from this, this single cell amoeba. In fact, in 2010, National Geographic, they published an article, and this is what they had to say. All life on Earth evolved from a single cell organism that lived roughly 3.5 billion years ago, a new study seems to confirm. The study supports the widely held universal common ancestor theory first proposed by Charles Darwin more than 150 years ago. Now, now this is a pretty big difference. But things are going to get, they're going to get come congruent. Just hang with me. But So they go on in the article, and here's what they say. The statistical analysis showed that the independent origin of humans is an absolutely horrible hypothesis, Theobald said, adding that the probability that humans were created separately from everything else is 1 in 10 to the 6,000th power. Wow, I mean, everything, gone, shattered, done. So who's this Charles Darwin? Well, he was born in 1809, grew up around 1831, he became what he would say is a naturalist. He got invited to go take a trip on the Beagle, and for five years he traveled all around the world. Perhaps his most impactful place that he traveled was the Galapagos Islands. And from there he started to formulate that life, as he saw it, was evolving. He came up with this theory of evolution, this natural selection, survival of the fittest, and that things came from the single cell amoeba, and they would just grow and, and turn into something else, and then that would eventually turn into something else. And he had some pretty strange things that he came up with. In fact, what he published in 1859, there was a couple changes in later books because he was ridiculed so much by some of his parts of his theory that he took them out of the book. But come on, let's be honest. His book's pretty strange and radical as it is. So what did he propose? Nothing else but life that we know and that we see and that we understand and that we live we evolved. Now, you may hear, oh, oh, you came from apes, and the apes came from this, and, ape, and something else came from that. And when you trace it all the way back down to its natural development, as he would put it, it came from an amoeba. One cell produced everything that we see here. But he gave a caveat. Here it is. If it could be just demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Really? What if I told you that a mousetrap could disprove his theory? Yeah, this mousetrap. This simple mousetrap could disprove his theory. Michael Behe, who was a biochemist at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, he took on and he wrote Darwin's Black Box. Well, what he was saying is, look, Darwin doesn't have what we have today. So his black box is looking into the cells. He didn't see these things. If he could have, maybe he would have found something 
different, would have came up with another theory than what he did. But Michael Behe wrote this in regards to the challenge that even Darwin said about his theory. If you could find this, it would disprove everything. This is what Michael Behe wrote. Irreducibly complex systems is, and here he quotes, composed of well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. Uh, you say, well, that sounds deep. I'm not really sure what that means. Well, look at the mousetrap. There are, as you see here, essential parts. Well, take one of them away. Will the mousetrap work? No. You take the base away, for instance. You say, well, I'll just put it on the floor. Well, but you still have to have a base. Take the catch away. Well, it won't work. Take the hammer away. Well, it's not, the mouse isn't going to get hurt. You take any one of these parts away, and it ceases to exist and be a mousetrap. It's just a beautiful piece of machinery that was invented that does nothing. It's irreducibly complex, meaning it couldn't exist and function properly with just four of the parts or three. It has to have all five to do so. Remember what Darwin said? Let's look at it again. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. The magnificent eye. I mean, we don't think about it until we don't have the use of it. But it is deep and complex, and if you were to take any one function away, it would cease to exist. It goes along with Michael Behe's theory, and it also disproves Darwin. Dwight Nelson writes, writes this very succinctly in his, in his book that he published about 20 years ago. Light strikes the retina and reacts with a retinal molecule that immediately changes shape. The changes in shape forces the protein rhodopsin to which this molecule is closely attached to change shape also. The change in shape of rhodopsin causes it to be attracted to a second protein, transducin. When that happens, the transducin drops off a small molecule and accepts a slightly different one in its place. Transducin protein now binds to a third protein, phosphodiesterase, which has the ability to cut out a third molecule, which reduces the number of positively charged sodium ions. The resulting imbalance of positive and negative sodium ions inside and outside the cell membrane causes an electrical charge that is transmitted down the optic nerve and is interpreted by the brain as vision. If you took one of those things away, it would not exist. The eye would not function. I, I, and Darwin knew this. In fact, he tried to argue unsuccessfully to some, successfully to others, that, well, well, the eye is different. My, what I said about, you know, if you could take away an organ, couldn't exist without these multiple things happening at one time, the eye doesn't count. Because it was, came from the, the human eye came from an animal eye that came from this eye that came from that eye. And it just kind of grew and it expanded. And what the eye we have, well, it could have existed. Well, Behe is saying, no, look at what the eye can do. It cannot function by itself. Any of these things are missing. You have to have all of them. It's irreducibly complex. Well, it gives other examples, but I'm going to share another one with you. Blood clotting. Now, we don't, again, we don't think of blood clotting until it happens. We cut ourselves and we, we dab it. And, and then eventually, very shortly, the body does something miraculous to stop it. Well, here's, again, what blood clotting, here's what's involved in it. One, the blood clot forms to discontinue the flow of blood. Two, the clot must form in the right place to be effective. Three, it needs to form at exactly the right time. And lastly, four, it must be strong to withstand normal blood pressure. Blood clotting, I mean, I, I, fascinating. But Richard Dawkins, he wrote in The Blind Watchmaker, he writes and takes it a little bit further. When an animal is cut, a protein called Hegman factor sticks to the surface of cells near the wound. Bound Hegman factor is then cleaved by a protein called HMIK to yield activated Hegman factor. Immediately, the activated Hegman factor converts another protein called pre to its active form, calicrin. Calicrin helps HMAK speed up the conversation of more Hagman factor to its driven form. Activated Hagman factor and HMAK then together transform another protein called PTA to its active form. Activated PTA in turn together with the activated form of another protein called convertin switch a protein called Christmas factor to its active form. Finally, activated Christmas factor together with a hemophiliac factor, which is then itself activated by thrombin in a manner similar to that of pro-accelerin, changes Stewart factor to its activated form. We are amazing human bodies. When you cut yourself, this is what takes place. If you take one of those out, you, it, it won't clot. It's a necessary thing that must take place. It's an irreducibly complex aspect of the human body. Well, here's what Behe's conclusion is. In the face of enormous complexity that modern biochemistry has uncovered in the cell, the scientific community is paralyzed. No one at all can give a detailed account of how the cilium, vision, or blood clotting, 
or any complex biochemical process might have developed in Darwinian fashion. But we are here. Plants and animals are here. The complex systems are here. All these things got here somehow. If not in Darwinian fashion, then how? That, and that's the question. If you choose to have this one theory that you believe it just came from nothing, which, by the way, Isaac Asimov has this great theory about nothing. Nothing is actually no thing, which is what rocks dream about. <laughs> I love that quote. You have a problem, but what if you just let a little sliver into your mind that said, I wonder if, and then we could look at this writing by Paul, who is well documented as actually existing in the first century AD. He wrote a letter to a group of people in Rome, and this is what he said. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. What Paul is writing here is, you look around, and God's saying, okay, you want to know who made it. You want to know where it came from. You, you have these deep, deep scientific questions. You have these philosophical questions. And Paul's saying, God clearly just made it and said, I did it. Either God exists or we created him. Well, you're, you're tracking along and you're saying, you know what, Dean? I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not really 100% convinced yet. But I'm, I'm tracking and I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Well, let me give you a little bit more. So several years ago, Jim Bergman, a biologist, wrote in this incredible book, In Six Days, he wrote about the aspect of the human body. Now, we're fascinating. We're, we're made up of 206 bones. And here's what he has to say. To determine the possible number of different ways 206 parts could be connected, consider a system of one part which can be linked up on only one way, one times one, or a system of two parts in two ways, one times two, a system of three parts which can be aligned in six ways, one times two times three, one of four parts in 24 ways, one times two times three times four, and so on. Thus, a system of 206 parts could be aligned in 1 times 2 times 3, all the way to 206 different ways, equal to 1 times 2 times 3 times 206 with an exclamation point. The value, 206, exclamation point, is an enormously large number, approximately 10 to the 388th power, which is 1 followed by 388 zeros. Do you want to count them? There's 388 zeros here. I counted. That's how many zeros. Now, it doesn't mean anything until he goes further. So he goes on. It's going to make sense here in a minute. Achievement of only the correct generally position required, ignoring now of where the bones came from, their upside down or right side up placement, their alignment, the origin of the tendons, ligaments, and other supporting structures, for all 206 parts will occur only once out of 10 to the 388 power random assortments. This means that one chance out of 10 to the 388th power exists of the correct order being selected on the first trial in each and every trial afterward, given all the bones as they presently exist in our body. If one new trial could be completed each second for every single second available in all of the estimated evolutionary of astronomical time, about 10 to 20 million years, using the most conservative estimate gives us 10 to the 18th power, the chances that correct general position will be obtained by random is less than once in 10 billion years. Wow! Does that blow you away? Look at that. The odds of taking our human body, these bones, and placing them in the right place, getting them in the right position. Look at this one more time, what he says. The chances that the correct general position will be obtained by random is less than once in 10 billion years. Are you blown away yet? I mean, you think about it. Whether you're looking up into the universe and seeing billions and billions of stars and galaxies, or you are looking into the microscope into a single cell amoeba. Is it really plausible that this came from nothing? I mean, think about it. It just showed up, all of this. I mean, take a look at the world around you, the delicate, beautiful flowers, the amazing butterfly that starts as a caterpillar and turns into a, a, a butterfly. I mean, that in itself is an amazing feat. The hummingbird, its wings flap somewhere between 50 and 80 beats Per second, it just came out of nothing. Have you ever looked up into the mountains and say, where did they come from? Out of nothing? Or into the depths of the ocean and the beautiful life forms that are there and you say, it just came from nothing? 
What about our human body? I mean, it's considered to be the most complex machine on the planet. Our human brain. It's fascinating. The human brain can hold as much information as 20 million four-drawer file cabinets packed full of text. That's our brain. That's our body. And then you wonder why we can look at Genesis 1-1 and we see this here and we doubt it, some of us. But what it says is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, why does it matter? Why, why does where we came from, how we got here, why does it matter? Because I, I do think it matters. It answers the first and most important question that we could ever ask. Now, what are those five questions? Where did we come from? Our origin. Who are we? It's our identity. Why are we here? Meaning. How should we live? Morality. And where are we going? Our destiny. It's all answered right here. I share this with you as we get ready to wrap it up. So God created man in his own image. That's our origin. So in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. David wrote in Psalms 139, it's probably one of the more fascinating looks into our human life, because you, you, might, you might be saying, well, he created Adam, maybe, but what about me? Did I just happen by chance? No. You are a single, idealistic, one-of-a-kind, no other mold creation. Here's what David writes in Psalms 139. For you formed my inward parts. He's talking about God. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. So what does it mean? You know, there's a lot of different religions. And, and then there's deist, atheism, ag agnostic. I mean, everything in between. But there's only one God who created None of these other religions, none of these other philosophical arguments have a beginning point that makes sense. They all start somewhere. So I want to give you something to think about as we wrap this up. You're, you're contemplating, you say, well, why does it matter? I mean, I've thought about God, I've heard about God, now you're giving me compelling evidence that there is a God, and He created all these things, and it makes sense. I mean, I feel better about myself that I didn't just show up, I didn't just come from an ape. I mean, I'm a little bit more refined than that. I think, I, I even saw a cartoon that said, the ape said, I hope that we're nothing like them. because <laughs> They kill each other. They abuse each other. Well, we're not like that. But you're, 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 there's something in your mind that's starting to process, and you're thinking, well, maybe there's a possibility. I want to introduce you to Pascal. He, he, he was in the 17th century. You may have heard of Pascal's Wager. Well, I'm going to just share with you from, from one of his pensees. I want to give you something to think about and to, and to dwell on. It's very deep. Are you ready? Because I think this answers the argument, and I hope that you'll, that you'll pay attention to this really closely. This is what he writes. Let us then examine the point and say, either God exists or he does not. But which of the alternatives shall we choose? Reason cannot decide anything. Infinite chaos separates us. At the far end of this infinite distance is a coin being spun which will come down to heads or tails. Now, what he's saying is heads, God exists, tails, God doesn't exist, or vice versa. But he goes on. How will you bet? Reason cannot determine how you will choose, nor can reason defend your position of choice. You're not a free agent. You are committed to making a choice. Which then will you make? Go on. Since you have to choose, let us see what is of least interest to you. For you may lose two things, the true and the good, and there are two things that you are putting at stake, your reason and your will, your knowledge and your happiness. By your nature, you have two things from which to escape, error and unhappiness. Since you must make a choice, your reason is no more affronted by choosing one rather than the other. But what about your happiness? Let us weigh the consequences involved in calling heads that God exists. Let us assess the two situations if you win you win everything, but if you lose, you lose nothing. And then he concludes, don't hesitate then, but take a bet that he exists. I'm going to ask you to do something. I mean, some people might cringe, but you go to, the, you, you, you go to Las Vegas or somewhere and, and they're playing poker and they, and they get all excited and they think, I've got a winning hand, I, I really sense it. And they say, I am all in. And they push their chips to the center of the table. You know what Pascal's saying? Be all in on, on that God exists. Because really when it comes down to it, 
what will you lose if, you, if, if he does? You lose nothing. You gain everything. But what if you choose, well, he doesn't exist, and I'm just going to err on that, and that's going to be where I let the coin drop. He's saying, well, you didn't lose anything because you didn't gain anything. So I'm going to ask you to do something. You heard what I shared here in this session. The amazing universe. Einstein even admitting. It started somewhere. The Hubble Space, Space Telescope focused in into this little spot in the universe that looks like there's nothing there and it comes back with thousands of galaxies. We see the complexity of the human eye of blood clotting. We see Darwin's theory, by his own admission, totally destroyed by this irreducibly complex aspect. And then you have to ask yourself, where did it come from? And if I can answer that question, where did it all come from, then I can answer the one question about me. Where did I come from? What's my origin? And you recognize, and, and by, by, as Pascal saying, put it that God exists. Push all your chips whew, right to the middle. And you say, I must be important. And there must be a reason for me to be here. I'm not an accident. I didn't come from an ape. I didn't come from a long line of great amoebas. I came from a God, a creator, who lovingly, as David shows us, crafted me, handmade. I am who I am because of him. Even those who the world would say they're defective with disabilities, with, with challenges physically or mentally, God still created, sin destroyed. We'll talk more about that here in another couple sessions. But still a handcrafted creation. So I ask you as I close up, do you want to just keep going as you are? Or are you willing to go all in that God exists? I believe that if you will, it will make an incredible difference in your life, which we'll find out here in the next session.